from as far back as ancient Egyptian times. People had made the connection between sugar and an incurable disease with a wide range of serious chronic symptoms. It was not until the late 1800s that the pancreas was found to have a major role to play. If removed, severe diabetes quickly develops. Deep within the pancreas, there are small islets, called the islets of Langerhans, named after the anatomist Paul Langerhans, who discovered them in 1869. It's here that insulin is made, an essential hormone needed for cells in our body to absorb glucose for energy. In type 1 diabetes, the ability to produce insulin is lost. In a healthy pancreas, release of insulin is fine-tuned in relation to glucose obtained from the food we eat. Blood sugar levels beyond a defined range can become fatal. From the 1920s, mass production of insulin, initially extracted from the pancreas of cows, has revolutionised the way we treat diabetes. Today, for type 1, monitoring glucose and injecting insulin is still the gold standard treatment. Um, I was diagnosed quite early on, so I went through what was known as the honeymoon period where my body was still producing insulin, just it was slowly not producing enough and eventually stopped altogether. Uh, I personally have an insulin pump, which pumps the insulin into my body so I don't have to give injections. It's just a different way of giving insulin. Uh, I still have to put in how many carbs I'm having and what exercise I'm doing. It just gives the insulin to me differently. Um, I'm on insulin injections, um, so I take roughly four injections a day. One's a long acting at night and then I take fast acting insulin where I have a meal because it reacts straight with the food. Whereas the long acting is what a, a normal body would do, have a continuous loop of insulin always in your system. Diabetes is a diverse and complex disease with over 50 variants and a fundamental difference between type 1 and 2. Cells within the pancreatic islets, called beta cells, both monitor glucose and release insulin accordingly. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease in which beta cells are actually attacked by our own immune system. Although insulin has saved millions of lives, with so many factors involved, it is almost impossible to reach the fine tuning of a healthy group of cells. Episodes of high and low blood sugar have a huge impact on health. It's a major responsibility. In severe cases, with patients that have lost all their beta cells and whose glucose levels fluctuate to such an extent that it greatly impacts their health, a treatment has already been shown to regain some control. The shortage in donor organs is really a serious obstacle for beta cell transplantation. To give you an example, we can only transplant 15 patients per year. 15. Now, if you calculate the number of patients in Belgium that are on an insulin treatment, there are more than 50,000. I'm not saying that all those 50,000 patients should receive a graft, but the number that would fulfill the requirements is certainly much higher than 15 per year, so there is a serious shortage. Since the first trials in the 1980s, studies have focused towards finding the optimum numbers of cells needed to regain insulin control. With the proof that transplanting cells can be a successful treatment, scientists asked the question, what if we could make beta cells in the lab and use these for transplant instead of donors? We are trying to understand how beta cells are made in the body, in the pancreas of the embryo. And we hope that once we understand the different parts of it, we can put that together, apply it to stem cells that we grow in a lab, and we make them transform into beta cells. Concept is simple. <laughs> in, reality. <laughs> in reality, it's a little more difficult <laughs> because there are many, many steps. If you think about the steps that require you to go from that very, very early st embryo stage all the way to an adult pancreas, it's kind of like a tree with lots and lots of branches coming off of it. And when you get way out on that branch that is the pancreas and you start making lots of sub-branches. One of those branches is going to be the insulin producing cells. So researchers have been trying to produce beta cells for many years now 
And it's been quite tricky to do this because we don't fully understand how the human pancreas develops and all the signals that are required. Cells from the earliest stages of development, called pluripotent stem cells, can be grown indefinitely, each one storing the potential to become any cell type in the body. When fed with nutrients and the addition of special chemical factors, they can be guided along this complex developmental path to become the specialised cells of the pancreatic islets, including beta cells. There were uh, two papers published. That was the first time, I think, uh, when it was reported that uh, human pluripotent stem cells could actually be directed into a cell that shared functional properties with the beta cells. It's a very positive feeling among everyone who is trying to work towards treatment of uh, diabetic patients. As we move along this path, the potential of the cells becomes more refined. Scientists are studying a cell called the pancreatic progenitor, which now has the potential to become only the cells of the pancreatic islets. Unlike fully specialised cells, progenitors are still able to make copies of themselves. However, they aren't as easy to expand in number as pluripotent stem cells. And we take an angle that's a bit different from what other people are doing. We're focusing a lot on how to get the cells to expand. Because in the end, if we want to transplant a lot of patients, uh, we will need a lot of cells. In my mind, I think we have to devise a protocol which is less complicated if we're going to mass manufacture the cells. So the whole concept that we're sort of working toward yeah. is establishing uh, intermediate cell banks or cell banks with these progenitors mm -hmm. so that that could be our starting cell population. Because mm -hmm. the, the way it is now, that's a lengthy road, right? Although we can grow huge numbers of pluripotent stem cells, being able to expand numbers of beta cell progenitors may be advantageous as there are fewer steps for them to become insulin producing cells. With any prospective cell type, if they are to be transplanted, they will have to be protected from immune attack. So at this moment, we are transplanting a very limited number of subjects. First of all, because we have not enough cells, but second also because we have to give immune suppression and the risks have to balance the benefit. Scientists are looking at ways to protect lab-grown cells from immune attack. Groups are investigating using materials to actually encapsulate the cells. The first phases of human trials are now taking place. We are studying the product in patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, this is a combination product, so we, it's a cell therapy contained in a device that gives immunoprotection. Importantly, we're starting with evaluating safety to make sure that it's safe and well tolerated before we go to a higher dose of cells. The immune reaction that occurs that would destroy the cells requires cell-cell interaction. The way the device is designed, it has a what we call a semi-permeable membrane that allows the flow of oxygen and nutrients. One way to look at the device is like a tea bag. You have the tea leaves inside the bag, you don't want that into your tea, but you want all of the good things to come in and out. Developing materials that are permeable to the right level is a huge challenge. Other groups are looking at a technique known as microencapsulation, which can only be seen down the microscope. A combination of Teflar and alginate acts as a shield against the immune system. Safety is key. Human trials can take many years to run. Just as diabetes is a complex and diverse disease, the path to future treatments echoes this, taking many forms. Breakthroughs are bolstered by fastidious work. Being able to study and understand the stages of pancreatic development is not only useful for transplantation, but also looking at earlier stages of the disease and the possibilities of stimulating regeneration in the pancreas, or the prevention and protection of beta cells in the first place. The fact that we can make beta cells from stem cells now is also a new tool for the immunologist to start looking at you know, the biology of, of uh, the autoimmunity, working with real human beta cells, which have been more or less not available. It's a very exciting time in diabetes research. Developing potential treatments takes time. 
With the phases of human trials taking many years, broad collaboration is essential with the involvement of hugely diverse fields. The knowledge is so huge and our capacities as individuals are limited, so it's essential we collaborate. We work with people more distant like uh, engineers uh, or chemical engineers who can produce uh, materials where the beta cells can, can grow and be happy. So one of the things I think that's truly amazing about biology is the choice of a cell to become one thing or another. To understand the complexity of that actually requires a lot more analysis of biology than we've done before. So it's essential that we build a, an interdisciplinary team if we really, really want to understand how cells make choices and how they become truly mature cell types that can cure diseases.